My name's Lyndon Kelly. I have the privilege of being your host today. I'm an irrigation educator that works out of St. Joe County, Michigan, and I have a dual job with uh, Purdue and Michigan State on irrigation issues. So next up is uh, Dr. Marty Shilvers. Uh, he is a uh, plant pathologist out of Michigan State University Plant Pathology. He's uh, done some work in uh, soybeans, corn, wheat, other things. Um, of course, a lot of people, uh, we had lots of interest in drought and irrigation needs uh, a week ago, two weeks ago, and now all of a sudden uh, we're blessed with all this rainfall and wet water, weather, and we've got other issues at hand, right, Marty? That's right. Good morning, everybody. So yeah, this morning we're going to talk about um, tar spot um, management and um, yeah, please put those questions in the chat box. Okay, let's get started. So first up, um, scouting for tar spot. Um, unfortunately, I think most people on the call have seen tar spot um, and it's really easy to identify once it gets to this really bad stage, right? Once, once the plants are really lit up, um, it's easy to find. Right now, it's pretty difficult to find. Uh, we haven't had any confirmations here in Michigan yet. Uh, my colleagues in Iowa and Wisconsin have been reporting it just recently. So if I'm, and I've been out scouting and some of my people have been scouting too, and, and where I'm going to look is in that lower part of the canopy at the moment, probably that lowest sort of healthy leaf. Um, just looking you know, around that, that lower part of the canopy, looking for these individual spots. And this is also one of the major tricks here. Um, it's not as easy to identify as many of the other diseases that we work on. Um, you know, those little spots can be confused with other things. Um, and the primary culprit is insect frass or bug poop, um, but that'll rub off the leaf. So put some water or rub, rub that leaf and see if that spot will rub off. So like in this example here, that bug poop is coming straight off the leaf. The other way to tell if it's tar spot is typically that tar spot lesion will be protruding through the backside of the leaf. So you turn that leaf over, you know, bug, um, bug poop isn't going to do that, right? It's not going to be sticking through. I mean, definitely the bug can get around and poop on both sides, but that tar spot will be protruding through the backside. Late in the season, there can be some confusion with um, rust um, as they produce those darker spore types. But... Uh, right now, um, there's a lot of confusion with bug poop in many areas. And we don't want you to be spraying a field just because you see bug poop. That's going to be a, a waste of fungicide. So uh, how does this tar spot work? Well, um, unfortunately, it's surviving on all the infected debris all the way across Michigan. So it doesn't really matter if you're tilling or you're rotating. There's enough if you have you know, extended crop rotations, there's enough debris out there um, to act as a source for this disease. Um, so essentially spores are gonna come from the debris that we have in the field and initiate infections. Um, last year, we had about seven to 10 days of pretty continually just wet weather at the very, very end of June. I found tar spot um, July 1. Um, so I have no doubt we're going to find it very soon, especially given the recent wet weather we've had. And then once it's actually in the plant, it takes about, about two weeks, two to three weeks from a spore landing on the plant for it to produce that black tar spot and then start releasing more spores. So there's always a little bit of latency between infection and when you see tar spot and then it beginning to spread again. But one of the very unfortunate things is that this, you know, this cycle can occur many, many times during the season, especially with leaf wetness. Um, and so we end up having an explosion of disease um, develop um, during the season. So this is where, you know, tar spot's been confirmed. Um, I have no doubt that it's probably in these other counties of Michigan, right, where we just haven't got a sample for it. Um, it's, even in the UP, uh, it's been confirmed. So pretty much across all of our corn growing acres. Um, it was first found in Indiana and uh, Illinois. It's indicated by this darker red color. Um, things were fairly quiet as things, it was just sort of building disease pressure. 2016, we found tar spot um, in Allegan County. And again, it, we saw it again in 2017. And in 2017, we actually had a field that was pretty lit up with disease and you know, estimated 30 bushel loss from that. It wasn't until 2018 that that really grabbed everyone's attention because we had 
Similar to last year, it was a very wet season, lots of rainfall uh, during the year, lots of leaf moisture. And so we had this absolute explosion. You know, we had inoculum sort of moving out, spreading around previous, but then we had that wet season. So right around uh, Lake Michigan, we had very, very severe disease. And you know, reports of 50 up to 100 bushel um, losses, especially under irrigation where you're providing additional moisture. So that's what's happened. And again, uh, 2021 was pretty bad, uh, including even you know, um, South Central, South um, Eastern Michigan as well, just as you know, that weather, wet weather um, you know, enabled a lot of disease development during 2021. So what have we seen so far? Well, here's a, here's a map of that. As I just said, you know, Wisconsin and Iowa have some reports. Uh, what I also found really interesting last year is that it was found in a number of counties in Georgia um, late in the season. And there was even some tweets coming out in late January of this year of tar spot on volunteer corn. Um, and so that's obviously concerning. And I don't know if they had a killing frost or not um, in the meantime, but you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure there. So, you know, we will be putting updates at this website um, as we go through the season here. So if, you know, if you want to keep a track of that, um, you can go to this IPM pipe corn uh, website, just Google that and I'll be tweeting it as we go through the season as well. Uh, but the bottom line, really, it's here, you know, expect it to arrive at some point in your field. And when's that going to happen? Well, you know, leaf moisture is absolutely critical. We have leaf moisture events, we're going to see um, disease. And if we're irrigating, right, that, that's another way to create leaf moisture events. So here's that uh, June to August 2021 depart departure from normal map, just to show you we were really wet, right? Um, and that's, that's what really helped to drive um, disease last year. And just a, a photo to demonstrate the um, significance of moisture. Um, this is 2019, so uh, a far drier year than either 2018 or 2021. You can see here under the center pivot, it's, that field's been shut down and that was tar spot that did that, right? So you're thinking, well, like let's just rip up the pivots, like that they're all useless, right? Well, no, that's not, not the case at all. Um, and this is a good example of that. We still need moisture, right? To, drive grain development, plant development and everything. So in this particular example, yes, we drove disease under that pivot, absolutely. Um, and there's other examples we can show and talk about, but we needed that moisture. So under the pivot, we were yielding somewhere in the order of two, 230 bushels uh, and in the dry corn is 190, right? So it's around about a 40 bushel advantage to irrigating, even though we drove disease. And in wet seasons, I can show you the opposite effect, right? Where we've irrigated and maybe we didn't need to irrigate as much anyway because we had a lot of moisture during that season and we've actually lost yield under the pivot. So, you know, be mindful if you're irrigating. Uh, put on as much moisture as your soil can handle and avoid light frequent applications and hope the rain does the same for us as well. Okay, so in terms of trying to look at risk of tar spot, um, there's an app here called Tar Spotter. Um, I'll just go through that real quick right now. Um, there's also a um, subscription version called Field Profit that has a couple other functions to it. Um, so let me share my screen really quick. Oops, I've already done that, haven't I? So let me just pull that over. So here's my... Um, cell phone screen just to show you tar spotter uh, the app is down here in the right hand corner right so that's free to download to the tar spotter app is so we can go in here create a new field uh, let's give it some sort of rubbish name and then we can go through and and run some questions here uh, or answer some questions has a fungicide been applied in the last 14 days no because we don't want you you know it's going to stop you if you've made a fungicide application. Are we within V8 to R4? Yes, we are still. Um, and then run model. And you can actually input as well the amount of um, irrigation. And of course, my phone's shutting down now, so we might have to stop that. But basically what's going to happen next is that it's going to um, give you a point 
and you'll be able to um, see the risk for that particular location. So zooming in here on cold water, we're at very high risk, right? We're above that 40% threshold for um, conditions favorable for tar spot. So um, they're color coded, um, yellow is lower risk, right? Uh, red is high risk. So you can see across Michigan, we're in that high risk zone. So, all right. So that's task water at a quick glance. And you can go back to last year's um, data and you know, look at, at previous um, historical uh, weather data. Because basically that's all that, that app is doing is pulling uh, weather data for that GPS location that you input um, and running the app, um, running the algorithm to give you that risk prediction. Okay, so TaskBot is one tool that we can use to look at the amount of risk um, that we have. Um, what else can we do for management? So hybrid um, susceptibility or you know, tolerance is really critical. Um, I, I can't stress that enough. And really that's, that's a conversation you should have with your seed um, dealer about you know, how susceptible is my variety here that I'm growing. There's no varieties that are completely immune to disease, unfortunately. Um, and we're all working very hard at trying to breed um, corn varieties or, or screen corn varieties for resistance to this disease. We're also doing a number of different trials, um, fungicide trials, uh, variety trials, and then screening germplasm. So this, this particular location we were doing um, quite a bit of our work is down in Van Buren County. Um, near Decatur, uh, Michigan. Um, so we're under irrigation and we want that, right? We want to keep pushing disease if it is a dry season. Um, the data that we develop is then also used to populate this fungicide efficacy chart. So you can find this if you go into the um, Crop Protection Network, just Google Crop Protection Network and then search fungicide efficacy. And we have fungicide efficacy for control of corn diseases, soybean foliar diseases, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of these different charts that we update yearly. And so we have a column now for tar spot and we rank these different um, fungicide products based on the data I'm gonna show you now. So I'm just gonna pick a couple of trials. Um, I, I think these are, good summaries of the data that we have and fall in line with other trials that we've done as well. So this first one was done across five different locations. So Michigan, um, Indiana, uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Ontario. So we looked at this lineup of products um, that are listed here, including you know, Delara Complete, uh, Mirvis Neo, Rebutech, et cetera, Veltima. And we put them on at silking at that R1 timing. And then we looked at how much disease suppression we got from those products. So that gray bar there is a non-treated control. And as you can see, that had the most amount of disease. I um, mean, was statistically you know, significant, significantly different to all of our different treatments that we put on there. Um, there were a couple of uh, products that sort of had a little bit of an edge, but all of the products um, appeared to provide good disease suppression. And we can go to different trials and yes, that you know, things vary a little bit by trial and certainly by timing, but this is what we saw across, across the board. And then looking at the yield data. Um, so we um, saw on average across these five different locations, um, 207 bushel from our non-treated check. Um, and then you know, we're ranging from 214 up to 225, depending on that particular treatment that was applied, okay? Um, and differences, um, sprayed or not sprayed, will certainly vary, obviously, depending on the amount of task spot pressure, right? We've already talked about how important the weather is for that, but also hybrid um, tolerance to disease. If you've got a very susceptible variety, um, you're going to need that fungicide application more and, and you, you, you know, may see a slightly bigger difference between treated and non-treated versus a variety that's got very good tolerance to disease, which still may need a fungicide, but um, hybrid tolerance will also, you know, affect the um, differences that we see here. Um, here's another trial that we did. Um, this is just our Michigan data um, down at Decatur there. And I like this slide because it just also um, reminds us about the other issue with tar spot and that stalk integrity. We go through and we do a push test 
on our plant. So we've just pushed them at shoulder height to the next row and see if they snap. If they snap, we record that. And so here's what we're seeing here. And this is out of, the scale is out of 10 plants. We look at a lot more than that. But so we see nearly 70% um, stalks snapping, not passing that push test when we have no fungicide applied. Uh, when we put these various products on, they all help to reduce the amount of um, snapping and lodging, right? And a couple of the products, you know, seem to be, you know, maybe performing a little bit better than others. But regardless, um, there's some protection there. And, you know, the important thing is be aware of stalk lodging. Like, this is a really big deal, right? So if we get, um, well, we will get tar spot, be mindful of um, lodging, um, and you know, maybe make a plan in terms of harvest, harvest those fields that are more likely to go over in a windstorm or something um, before others. Um, and then here's the yield data from that. Um, so we've got our untreated check here. Um, and then uh, these various products. So in this particular trial, we're seeing you know, somewhere between 25 to 50 bushel um, yield advantage to those fungicide applications, right? So, so the yield advantage is always gonna vary a little bit, again, depending on pressure and the, the hybrid and whatnot. All right. And then, okay, so the other really important thing to talk about is the timing of fungicide applications. So we just looked at tar spotter and how that can be used to predict risk, right? Um, but we've also gotta have disease present, right? Uh, we can have risk, but potentially no disease present. Um, so what we've seen over the last uh, four years or so is that really the best timings for tar spot um, suppression are, are typically between tassel and through to R2 to brown silk, maybe sometimes beyond that, certainly. Um, very early vegetative applications typically are, are not too different from non-treated um, uh, plots, right? So early applications are just, just don't tend to, to do much. Um, you can see a bit of a stair step here too, as we get into later vegetative applications, we've got a little bit more uh, disease suppression. So that's, that's good to see. But typically, if we have to order a single pass of fungicide, I would often recommend between tassel and, and brown silk um, for the most part. Um, here's some data from um, Decatur uh, from last year, where we were looking at Veltima in a fungicide timing study. And this study was actually done in um, Indiana and Wisconsin as well, and a couple of other states. And similar patterns were observed. Uh, I think one of the more important things is with two applications, we weren't necessarily much better than a single application. Um, so what I want to point out here. We were just uh, above our statistical you know, line where we start separating um, yields, you know, giving them the, those letter designations and we feel more comfortable when we can do that. But I, I think the, the layout of the data still tells that story. So two applications here, Veltima V13 and R3 yielded the best. That was 239 bushel. But, you know, it was only one bushel better than the single application of Eltima at um, R2. So, you know, that, that's sort of the main takeaway. Um, and then the timing again, you know, the R1 to R2 is typically going to be the, the better timing there. And, you know, if we're going to go out and spray, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, please leave some check strips. They don't have to be the complete length of the field. But I think it's really important, whether you're the applicator or the farmer, to, to have that sort of reference point. And ideally, you want to have you know, multiple check strips across the field to account for any variation, um, you know, tile lines, et cetera. But I think it's really important. It, it's worth you know, taking a hit in a very small segment of the field just to know, you know what, what am I seeing from this fungicide product? What, what was my return on investment? You know, markets are always changing. It might be even harder next year to, to make this call. Should I spend the money or not? So please, you know, do your homework on your own farm. And I think it's, it's very, very valuable. Okay, whoops, just jumped my last slide. So this is my last slide then. Um, this is what it really comes down to if you want the, the quick takeaway. Hybrid resistance or tolerance, partial resistance, whatever you want to call it, is the most important thing. 
So obviously we're already out there planted. If you don't really have a good understanding or a good feel for that, go back and talk to your seed dealer. Um, the weather is really important. And what we're really looking at here is leaf moisture, not how much rain we got, but how long was it wet for? Do we have dew, you know, at, you know, midday, do we still have dew on the lawn? That's a pretty good indication that, you know, things are really wet and we're, we're going to potentially have some, some tar spot issues. And the scout for those wild-type fungicide applications, you have to look carefully for this thing as it, as it starts in that lower canopy, those all black spots are hard to see. Typically from R1 through to VTR1 through to R3 perhaps, um, sometimes as late as R4, but you've got to be careful. Check strips, scout for lodging, the crop rotation and residue management. We do have studies out looking at this. We see a little bit more disease where we're corn on corn and no-till, just a little bit. It gets disease going a little bit earlier but not significantly. And we've had plenty of fields that have never had corn in them before, planted the corn and have been smoked with tar spot. And the problem is that you know, this inoculum is blowing in from outside. So please don't break out the moldboard plow um, at the end of the season. You just can be wasting a whole bunch of diesel fuel. So um, that's what I have. And I would be happy to answer questions. We'll probably go to the weather, I think, and then we can circle back. Marty, could you start working through the questions. You have a number of questions in the chat and I know you've been answering some of them. Yeah, so there's some really good questions here and just you know, things we didn't have time to get to. So I'm glad, thank you for speaking up. Uh, one of those was, you know, does tar spot show up on anything other than corn? Um, so far, no, we haven't confirmed it on sorghum or, or any other grass species. Um, there was some concern with one or two growers that they may have been seeing it on, on something else. So if that happens, please get a samples in so that we can check on that. Um, and I've got contact details for a couple of people I'm going to follow up with. But no, to date, um, we have not seen it affect any other crop, thank goodness. Um, there are other tar spot or um, phylocora is the name of the, the fungus. There are other phylocora that can cause spots on, on grasses, but but the, the one on corn seems to be pretty specific to corn. Um, can you spray during pollination? Yes, um, you do need to be very careful there when we're you know, tasseling. Basically, was it from V8 through to tassel? We need to be very careful about um, adding additional um, surfactants to the tank because we can cause arrested ear development, you know, basically just burning things a little bit in terms of um, pollination process. Um, so you need to be careful, but yes, you can spray at, at tassel and, and during silking. Um, is there a big difference between application methods, plain or ground rig, which is better? Is there a significant difference? I wish we had more data on this, but um, I've seen plenty of demonstrations where a plain works just fine and a ground rig works just fine as well. There's always pros and cons to, to different application methods. Um, if you've got a good applicator that's doing what they should be doing, you should get um, pretty good coverage through both systems. Obviously, the gallons per acre is different, but there's different dynamics happening in terms of the actual application. Um, yeah, ground rig, I guess you can run over corn as well. So, you know, again, pros and cons, right? But um, I have not um, heard or seen really big differences, um, and I've seen good results with both systems. So uh, I like this one too from Vand. This is really uh, one we're still trying to figure out. So if we have um, initial infection started, so if we can find it out there now, but it's only you know a few plants and it's only low in the canopy, um, and we're currently you know V12 to V15, um, and they want to wait until silk. Um, can we wait? Yes, I think you probably can. Um, so this sort of comes back to what do you have in your control too? If you need to call and schedule an aircraft, you probably should do it today because it might take a while to get that aircraft out anyway. If you own your high, own high clearance equipment and you know you can get across the acres when you need to, yes, I think you can wait. You need to watch very carefully and scout carefully. Um, and scouting corn is difficult, right? Because it's, it's hard to cover a field, um, but you need to be paying attention to things because things can change quickly. So I'm reluctant to say like, yeah, let's wait until we have a certain amount of pressure. However, I think what we've seen in some of our trials is that we might be able to wait until, as long as it's very like, you know, one or two lesions on a plant at their very lowest leaf, we might be able to wait until we're up to about 50% of those plants starting to show a spot. 
that threshold might be lower, it might be 20% of plants. And it's so hard to look for, right? So I, I, I'm very reluctant to say this, but you know, I, I think you can wait a little bit. Um, you just you want to be careful. And again, you know, you may have latent infections that are not showing yet, and it takes you know, two or three weeks for them to actually show. And it's like, oh, okay, you know, I should have sprayed. So um, be, be mindful of that. But I think you can wait um, to, to some extent, especially with you know dry weather coming and, and le less leaf moisture. <clears throat> How late is too late to spray fungicide? Well, um, I know um, you know Jason Roth did a really cool trial uh, back in 2019, I think it was, and he sprayed. I think it was August 18th or 20th, and you know he saw about a 20 bushel protection from that. However, disease was late to come in that season, um, so that matters. And I know some folks last year were really. We I went out there out to Allegan County, that area, and we were scratching our heads about late applications. Some guys made some later applications in, and I think in the most, for the most part, they paid. Um, that was the second application. But you do have to be careful of that. Once the plant's really lit up with tar spot, it may be too late. You're not going to like, you know, reverse that, right? And what really blows my mind with tar spot is you don't really need a whole bunch of spots on the plant for things, for the plant to be shut down. So that tar spot fungus is pumping out toxins that just sort of shut the plant down prematurely. Uh, and I think that's what really catches people off guard. You know, it only looks like a few spots that can develop pretty quickly. And then all of a sudden the, the things are shutting down prematurely. So be very careful. Don't rely on, you know, waiting until really late. And certainly, um, and I should just clarify too. So R5 is beginning of dent. I think that's probably as late as we want to go. So we are still accumulating um, dry matter in the um, kernels from the beginning of dense stage, but once we hit R6, that's black layer and black layer, we're done. We're not gonna set any more yield, right? So revenge sprays, you're all angry because you see a bunch of tar spot, probably not, not a great idea, right? And then, you know, I mentioned the latency period of two to three weeks after seeing infection, how quickly can a single lesion produce spores? Um, so I think once you see that lesion, it's really only a matter of a few days, right? That, that can start, um, with the right conditions, start producing spores. Um, and, and it's amazing. You, I, I'd encourage you too, if you happen to see tar spot, you know, mark that plant with that leaf with something with a flag or something, you can come back and watch. Um, and you'll very often see, you know, like a, a mother lesion and then a bunch of daughter lesions around that. Um, and, and yeah, that can happen in a couple of weeks if, if conditions are favorable. Uh, the question on this, uh, relative maturity as well, you know, can we escape this by planting short maturing varieties to some extent, but you're giving up yield potential, right? So the more important factor there is how tolerant or resistant are the varieties. That's far more important. Yes, we've documented more yield loss under longer season varieties, but they also have generally have greater yield potential. So keep that in mind. Um, Jeff, there was a Question, a couple of questions for you as well. Do you want to jump in? And, yeah, and one of them, and I think uh, that uh, Keith Mason has already addressed, but it just I think it was Ryan's question about in viral weather, uh, which of course is our, our meso network with, with uh, many, many applications. And do we have something like we do have for tree fruit? And viral weather does, does not, but I think the, the point Keith is making is I think that's what the... Um, your uh, web app or your phone app was showing. And uh, again, maybe it's, I think that's evolving uh, in, in terms of what's available and putting together that environmental information with, with the best disease algorithm that we have to try to give people some idea of risk. Uh, so that, that's, that's the phone app that, that you were showing, Marty. The other question I think was from, uh, that I noticed was from Eric uh, regarding leaf wetness. And we do have on all of our 100 plus sites in Enviro Weather, we do have a leaf wetness measurement or observation. And it's in a standard location. It basically is, is by the station itself. It is not in a plant canopy. We do have a number of stations or number of sites that do also have uh, one of these, these grids, a little resistance grid in a, in a canopy of, of interest uh, nearby. But the one to look at and the one that's plotted and the one that should be available first or default is, is the, 
the standard, which is uh, it's facing north. And it's just north of the station. Um, and Eric mentions uh, in his question that some do not show. They if if they don't show it, it may be a, pr a problem. Let us know because it should be there. Uh, now the other thing, the other there's one other way of looking at this too. Uh, we also measure, of course, relative humidity at all these sites. And if you look at the, the data between the leaf wetness grid, which is trying to simulate what the, the formation, uh, this, the deposition of, of dew or frost on a, on a leaf surface, uh, and then the evaporation of it later on, you can look at the relative humidity for the same time frame. And if it's about 90% or greater, you can assume that there's also liquid water on the plant surface. So if you don't have the leaf wetness information or observations, if you use a, a threshold, if that hour, the relative humidity stayed above 90%, you can be very, very confident. It's, it's, not, it's not one to one, but it's not far away from it. Uh, and it's another way, and it's, and it's, it's probably the way in, in the, the phone app for TarSpot that, that they're actually getting it at leaf wetness because a lot of people, there is no standardized way of, of measuring leaf wetness duration. It's just one way that we're approximating, but relative humidity at or above 90% is a real, real good proxy. And if you don't, and, and if you don't see it on that, on that station, let us know about it because it, again, there may be a problem that we don't know about and we wanna get it fixed. Uh, there was a question about spray tips as well. So typically we wanna use a flat fan nozzle. Um, and we were looking for droplets in the fine to medium um, droplet size of 200 to 300 microns to get good coverage of canopy. And there's some comments there about Weston being um, cutworm. Do you guys want to chat about that? Yeah, this is Chris here. I caught my first ones uh, from the traps this week. So I had a couple at KBS and a couple on campus. So it's, it's early. I put my traps out early to get a zero, you know, so had zeros last week. So if you are going to trap, you know, I'd put traps out this week for sure. And you're talking about maybe in two weeks, you're going to see a real uptick in catch. And remember, it's those pre-tassel fields where you can kind of feel the tassel uh, as, you, as you're kind of touching the top of the corn. And then as that tassel emerges, that those fields are going to be very uh, attractive attractive and um there's just a wide range of fields out there right there's late planted there's early planted those moths are going to find some place to go and um if you're in a neighborhood where you're the only later early planted field that field may could could be hit hard de depending on how flight lines up with timing so it's worth going in and checking so you don't get a surprise and uh, marty's talking about spraying it is okay to spray, to put insecticide in with your fungicide if you need to, but I always say opt for the fungicide timing because that's more critical. A lot of times, why put the fungicide on if it's not going to kill the fungus and you're going to kill some insects and maybe not all, but, but you really need to get that fungicide timing right, not defaulting to the insecticide timing. And I... Artie's nodding, so I think he agrees. And they typically coincide, right, Chris? Like that that silking window or, or thereabouts. They they often do. As an entomologist, if I was going to specifically time little dudes crawling down from the tassel and going into the ear, it might be off a, a few days. I mean, and once they get into that ear, it's really hard to kill them. So that's why you get some of that late season damage. But that's less... Uh, that's less of a concern than don't waste your money on an expensive fungicide application. And it's like just spraying water. You know, there's no use doing that. Yeah. So default to Marty, Marty's more important here. And, well, and this also brings up the, um, you know, like we, yeah, obviously we're focusing on task spot and everyone's freaked out about that. Like, but you know, let's not forget about other diseases. We've had some conversation recently um, about managing ear molds as well. Ear molds are tough to manage again, variety, Resistance is you know, a key element, tolerance, whatever you want to call it. Um, but if you're going to spray for an ear mold, you typically want to do that um, at that green silk timing, right? Once we go beyond that, then the efficacy really starts to drop. Um, and again, that, that may line up pretty well with tar spot and, and may potentially um, line up with Western Bean cutworm. And just along, so there's a linkage there with Western Bean cutworm and ear molds too, um, because of the insect feeding damage that tends to create wounds. And then we see more fusarium 
colonization of the ear and then my, more mycotoxin. So that, that's another factor that can drive uh, mycotoxin accumulation in the ear. So just a good thing to be mindful of. But you don't need insect damage to no. have ear molds. And just <laughs> because you have insect damage doesn't mean you're going to have the mycotoxin. So there, it's, a, it's a real um, wishy-washy sort of, uh, that's not a good term. I can't think of the term. I haven't had enough coffee yet. But it's not a tight, there's a link there, but it's not, you know, super tight. And I see here, Paul Gross has also caught some mustard bean cutworms in the central part of the state and uh, Eric Anderson in, in the in the southeast. So it is starting a little bit. Yeah. And if you happen to be out scouting for task spot and uh, find it, uh, please send me a photo so we can get that confirmed and put up on the map. Uh, just to help you keep track of things. I mean, you know, there's inoculum pressure all across Michigan as we talked about. So it's going to get here. It's just a matter of time. So already like I always say, if you're going to scout corn, you scout at the time where you can walk along and put the sun on the opposite side of the row. And then you can oftentimes see those egg masses through the leaf. Is there an optimal time of the day to scout for tar spot? Or is that just a stupid question? No, it's not a stupid question, but... Um... I, so typically we're looking down low in the canopy at the moment for tar spot. Um, yeah, I mean, I prefer it when it's not soaking wet, but <laughs> sometimes you got to do what you got to do as well, right? Um, so yeah, just really looking carefully at that lower part of the canopy for now. Um, and as the season progresses, we may certainly see lesions start to form in the upper canopy, especially as you know spores blow in perhaps from outside fields. So you want to be looking at the entire plant um you know turning leaves over just just being very vigilant but at the moment if i'm going to go out and look you know at, at corn that's starting to get up there i'm going to look first at the focus most of my attention on those lowest leaves you need two people one in the front's looking up at the at, for the western bean egg masses the second person's coming behind and they're looking down at that lower area that's right and put on a spray suit when you go out there it's yeah. so much easier yep. <laughs> when it's wet yeah so thanks for everyone being here. I think we're pretty close to that eight o'clock hour. Um, I did put, being an irrigation educator, I put some irrigation issue, uh, basic reference material about irrigation scheduling in the chat. If you're interested, look that up. Be glad, uh, Dr. Young Suk Dong or I uh, would be glad to talk to you about irrigation issues. So um, please give us a call. I see uh, Marty says, please send additional questions to him. And he put in um, his link uh, or his contact information. So please get back to us and uh, we'll see you next week.